Hi everyone, thank you for coming and welcome to today's conversation with some of the 2020 recipients of Diploma Honours. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Manish Verghis and I direct the AA's public program of lectures, exhibitions and other special projects for a diverse range of audiences. Um, today's event is one of my favourite annual presentations. Um, in addition to working and teaching here, I also studied here and I remember sitting in your position several years ago during my own introduction week watching the honor students from the previous year present. Um, I think I had a mixture of excitement and panic in my stomach about whether I would ever be able to do a project like this. But I think what you'll find is that they each felt the same way and here they are today as AA graduates ready to discuss their projects with you. So to tell you a little bit about Diploma Honors, it's the highest award you can achieve upon completion of the diploma program, um, up to 150 or per unit um, per diploma unit is nominated to present for honors at the end of each academic year and um, they do this kind of to the whole school and um, and then specifically to an audience of all the other diploma tutors and then on the penultimate friday they kind of perform a 10 minute presentation that needs to convince the diploma tutors of the value relevance and premise of their project and then the tutors go away and kind of have a, a private vote and um, the projects that receive the most votes are um, kind of decided and they're awarded honors and announced to the school. So I think as you're all aware, this has been a really unusual year in many ways, um, which has meant that some of our traditions like announcing and celebrating honors on the AA Terrace couldn't happen. But it's also been a year where new traditions were invented. So typically this event happens at 6 p.m. on a Wednesday, um, but instead it's happening at 1 p.m. British summer time to take into account the many time zones that our community is distributed across. I think even um, in, the in the students kind of talking today, Jane is coming to us from Hong Kong. And um, there's been quite a few of the honor students that have been unable to come because they're um, in, a in a different time zone or busy with their work um, or a new job that they've just um, started. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a kind of unusual time, but it's still an exciting time to hear about their projects. Um, also, usually this event would just have the honors recipients represent their projects as they did for honors. But um, this year, because their presentations were all recorded and available um, for you to watch in advance as part of the honors commendations, prizes, and exemplary projects um, exhibition online, um, I can just uh, I'll post the link in the chat so that if you haven't seen it already, you can go visit it. Um, so because that, that they were already online, um, we decided to structure this event a little differently. So instead it will be a kind of informal conversation to discuss the process of how each of the students developed their projects through their choice of site, media, position, audience, and then we'll end by kind of asking them what receiving honors meant to them. Um, just to tell you a little bit more about the exhibition, as part of the online um, listing, you can see there's also an amazing augmented reality element of the seven projects, which is designed by Jane as one of the honors recipients. And it works uh, via as an Instagram filter. So you can try it out by visiting the website and clicking on the link to launch Instagram, which will then project the exhibition on top of your context wherever you are in the world. Um, so you should like feel free to post that on your Instagram stories and tag the AA to show us what your version of the exhibition looks like. So before I start the conversation, I'll just give you a quick summary of the seven projects that were awarded Diploma with Honours in 2019-20, which um, based on the diversity of different subjects and approaches, I think really manifest the breadth of interest contained within the school which is everything from FM's ecosystem of small scale farms across the British countryside to Chris's network of public health sanctuaries that rise vertically to advocate for urban mental health or Buster's excavation of the Victoria embankment that reveals the urban history of the Thames. Um, Jane's investigation into how hostility is designed into environments to differentiate between the citizen and migrant sits alongside Matthew's documentation of the life of an asylum seeker to show how London becomes a space of exclusion. And then Hafiza's manual for a floating settlement in Brunei decolonizes the act and narrative of settling, whereas Russell's decolonization of museum collections uses performance to construct new cultural spaces and systems. And so each project tackles urgent issues that question the ways in which we design, live, and experience culture in today's society. Um, so I think um, today we have Hafiza Russell 
um, Jane and Buster, who are here to discuss their projects with you. Um, unfortunately, Matthew, Chris, and FM aren't able to make it because of pre existing commitments, but hopefully they'll participate another time. And in the meantime, you can watch their presentations online. Um, if you have any questions for our amazing honors recipients, just use the raise hand function and I can unmute you to ask your questions um, once we've got the discussion underway, or just post them in the chat and I can ask the question for you. And uh, yeah, don't forget to check out the exhibition. So um, maybe to start, I can just ask Jane to tell us a little bit more about developing the design of the augmented reality kind of filter, um, since that was something new that we're trying out this year. Yeah, I mean, um, the filter really came together as a way to kind of integrate and overlay everyone's work, where you could be wherever you are in the world and still kind of enjoy this exhibition. And the intention was kind of that you can get a bit up close and personal with it, um, using the filter, just like in an exhibition, and then you can kind of indulge in the details. So obviously it's kind of aiming to bring everyone into a common space, even when um, 36 Bedford Square isn't quite open yet. Um, and I guess the idea came out of, um, instead of our annual end of year show projects review, um, we did a kind of 12 hour live Zoom event that crossed time zones um, in June last year. And um, Hafiza and Jane uh, used to live together and they together with two of their friends um, did a kind of augmented reality um, projection onto our campus in Hook Park as their, um, as their kind of performance as part of the, um, of, of the event. So do you guys want to talk about what gave you that idea? Maybe Hafiza, do you want to say something? Yeah, I apologize because I have like a lot of construction noise right now, so just ignore it. Um, yeah, so so me, Jane, and another a friend of ours in Dip 18 joined forces, and um, two people from uh, Dip 18 joined forces to kind of um, do the exhibition. And we were trying to think of like how can we exhibit our projects in a way that that we haven't done the whole year. So we didn't want to do like a normal like. Um, uh, keynote or PowerPoint presentation where we would just kind of relay it back to the screen. Um, so we wanted to combine three of our projects, which all had kind of similar themes. Um, so we were thinking to combine it, we used one of our friends, like Hook Park as the site, um, the DIP18 unit, and then Jane did the augment the, the, the VR thing. Um, and I did, I kind of built a physical model because I did stuff on floating settlements and I kind of built a module um, because I haven't had a chance to do it the whole year. Um, and then I kind of uh, tested it out on a stream uh, uh, in, in Hook Park. So it was trying to like, like add different kind of um, methods of showing our project in, in, a, in, in not like a screen way. Um, and then, yeah, we had the VR, so we had our drawing, so we talked about it. Um, and yeah, and because the Dip 18 project in Hook Park was based about uh, was on um, kind of bringing the, like different pedagogy to architectural school and kind of experimenting that um, in the wildlife of Hook Park. Um, so yeah, we wanted to kind of incorporate all of our projects uh, within that kind of 20 minute slot, I think. Great. Well, I mean, then maybe I can ask. Um, you guys to answer the question of like how you felt your project reflected the kind of brief of the unit that you were in. So maybe you can say a little bit about the unit you were in and then how your project answered it. Um, Buster, do you want to start? You're on mute. Uh, okay, uh, first of all, I, I think it doesn't. And this is because the brief does not ask for answers. <laughs> and also because um, I think my project uh, raises questions about the brief itself. So for example, the brief uh, suggests that uh, slowness and smallness in the city um, is not, it doesn't fit in a fast changing urban landscape. And so I investigate this and I make the observation that actually the problem is not that slowness ex is excluded, but um, that slowness and speed are seen as um, opposing tendencies let's say so you're in dip 11 with shin sorry yeah dip 11 into the interior and so my question becomes can the slowness and duration of an excavation in this uh, case share a space with the urgency or speed of civil engineering so i'm 
by questioning the brief in this in this way, I, I don't I don't mean to remove uh, difficulties that I find in the brief, but more kind of find uh, what uh, difficulties I find animate or or live. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a great. I think it's a great point because I think the briefs that you just put out there are meant to be questioned and challenged and then transformed through the projects that you do. Um, Russell, do you want to answer the same question about the unit you were in? Uh, so I was in DIP12 uh, with uh, Inigo, Daisy and Ivan, being taught by Manager and Inigo this year. Um, and um, uh, the, the brief was about, was really about the wild and the other and my kind of interpretation of that was looking at, um, almost looking at the museum as the other, um, rather than the way in which the museum uh, often considers uh, communities and historically has, has kind of considered um, a lot of, uh, of uh, communities as, as the other. Uh, and so to kind of flip it on its head, look at the museum as the other, and the wild as um, kind of source communities contexts from the perspective of the artifact, um, kind of looking to return to a context where um, the communities have changed um, in terms of how they relate to it, um, uh, how their societies have changed in relation to it um, as a result of them existing in museums. Um, as a result of them being regarded as, as precious when they may never have been um uh, as them being kind of res re re uh, kind of regarded as as emblematic of those cultures when they may never have been um and so yeah i kind of avoided conversations regarding kind of rewilding and and directly kind of nature or climate related um projects to kind of you know kind of steer it in a in a direction that i kind of wanted to go in and, and felt was still very much relevant to that uh, to that brief uh, yeah yeah so i think it's also about making like making the brief what you want it to be to do the project you want to do um jane do you want to answer the question as well yeah uh, so diploma three last year it was the brief was titled the body politic um which can be interpreted as both kind of like the individual body but also the political body um, to do with biopolitics in general and it was kind of embedded in the framework of forensic architecture, um, where they use architectural methods as a, as a means of like investigating uh, human rights issues. So my project kind of took it slightly literally. So I looked, um, I started by looking at the migrant body in the UK and how they go through these different spaces and the kind of spaces that they traverse, but also the uh, physiology of the body, I suppose. Um, when it comes to how the body reacts in different environments. Um, so in a way, the body politic for me was kind of both the pol political one and the individual one, and basically how state apparatus is embedded in different ways when it comes to um, these migrant group groups. Visa, do you want to also answer the question for how your project worked with your brief? You're on mute. Um, so I was in uh, DIP 14. Um, uh, uh oh. I don't know what happened there, but um, maybe we'll just ask the next question. I'll try and find, find her visa again. <laughs> um, so I guess the next question I had for you, all of you was the kind of process you went through in making the project. I guess, did any of you go into the year knowing what your final project would be? And um, how did you work on it over the year? Actually, wait, Hafiza's come back, so maybe I'll <laughs> <have> finish her <laughs> answer. Sorry. Yeah, I press the cancel or something. Um, so yes, uh, I was in the 14, uh, and the brief was called um, Islands, Rethinking the Settlement Form from Property to Care. Um, so the whole brief was about um, challenging this notion of um, property, and um, looking at kind of new ways of settlement or, or looking through the historical ways of settling. Um, so we just, as, as a unit, we look, we thought that property was, um, is very um, exploitative and it just encourages exploitation rather than care. So 
we wanted to um, kind of completely rechange that and it, especially in like con in contemporary ways. So I wanted to do a project uh, on Brunei, which is um, a country in Southeast Asia, which is where I'm from. Um, and it's home to the world's largest um, stilt settlement. So um, I thought that was really interesting for the brief because the fact that it's on water instead of land kind of completely changes um, how we read property um, and kind of the fluidity of it um, just challenges this notion of property as being really rigid and stuck to the ground. Um, and I've also kind of used, um, kind of looked at um, other case studies um, uh, that also challenges this notion of property. So um, yeah, just kind of like a bigger theme. It was also about kind of decolonizing, uh, decolonizing um, the, the way we look at something. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. I'm on mute. Um, I guess uh, the uh, just maybe then now to follow up with that question of process, maybe we stay with you, Hafiza, to, to start us off on the process of how you worked on the project. Like, did you always know you wanted to do this project from the beginning of the year, or did you arrive at it over the course of the year? And what was the process of how you developed it? Um, so our unit is kind of research based. So the first first term was. Um, completely researched so the uh, the end of first term you get like a, you write a 3000 to 4000 word essay and you also end up with uh, the analogous map which is this um line drawing that summarizes your whole research um and a really good way to look at it is first term you can kind of see it as a separate project in itself that it's it's a it's a complete work of research that can stand on its own um so um we so you can write about whatever you want that obviously like kind of relates to the to the brief um and i was interested in generally a yeah, water settlement so i looked at three different case studies you can look at multiple or just one um and then that led me to the foundation of um kind of the academic foundation for my design project um so that catapulted me to um, second term, which is um, completely design. So you um, pick your own site, um, which for me was Brunei, which is one of my case studies. Um, and then you make, you set up your own brief um, and then you do all the line drawings. It's kind of a complete package of like plans and axos and all these things, all the diagrams, but you can always root it in your research. But the thing is, you could also your design can also be very different to your um, design, um, to your research um, kind of thesis. So it's very it's very open. You can it can be as close or it could be as broad as you want. Um, and then third term was um, representation. So um, images, um, all these um, all the colored kind of renders, um, and they. Um, and this is really interesting for the unit because they really emphasize on like composition. Um, and that every image that you produce needs to be carefully curated. Um, and I really enjoyed it because you, um, it's kind of, you have really fun tutorials where, where you like have a draft of your image and then you talk about how this image could be better, how to, how to crop an image and how, what, how to inhabit it in a curated way. Um, so it, it's very carefully um, thought out and it's a very kind of like artistic process as well. Um, uh because yeah every little detail needs to kind of um show what your argument is or, or what you're trying to say um so yeah so in general um you get to do a lot in each so research design and kind of representation and uh, experimentation i guess um so yeah i would recommend this unit <laughs> so yeah russell do you want to talk about your experience Um, so, oh, I can't remember now. Um, so, um, I don't think I knew exactly what I wanted to do during the year. Um, I knew that I, I kind of still wanted to continue on research from fourth year, looking at um, institutions, uh, looking at archiving and museums um, and ways that they could be reformed. So really for me, fifth year felt like a kind of continuation of a kind of ongoing body of research or development of a practice, um, which I think was very much kind of at the core of um, what DIP12 
uh, tries to do. Um, and um, yeah, for me, the, the process was a lot about pushing yourself outside of the confines of, uh, of the AIA or outside the confines of, of your institution and looking elsewhere for expertise outside of that that could feed into the work. Um, so we went to uh, UCL's archaeology department, uh, met with a professor there. Um, and then for me, it was kind of um, constantly sending emails to professors uh, in the Caribbean for information about artifacts there, um, as well as people from like Leiden University, um, who are incredible, um, to kind of get a, a very kind of multidisciplinary practice developing um, that was kind of fed from all sides by these experts. Um, and so that kind of carried consistently throughout the year. Um, the beginning of the year was really kind of trying to establish a framework of what you wanted that practice to be, um, but obviously knowing that that would develop over time. Um, from the beginning, I very much knew that I wanted to make a film, a conventional kind of architecture portfolio didn't feel like the right way to communicate the project to museums or institutions. It also didn't feel like the right way to communicate it to the communities who I wanted to work with. So it was about producing um, documents and a methodology that was appropriate for uh, the project that was appropriate for approaching museums in a way that was unthreatening because to some degree the project is kind of threatening to those institutions. Um, and even now, um, uh, when I speak to people from those institutions, there's good responses and then there's also bad responses to it. And yeah, a lot of the year was about navigating things in uh, the right way at the right time, um, whether it was dealing with the institution or the communities. Uh, yeah, I think that was probably my biggest takeaway as well. Yeah. Buster, do you want to answer? You're on mute. I'm a, I'm a beginner. <laughs> No, I, I was saying I, I want to try to explain the or answer the question through my site because in my case that was the very first thing. I didn't have an idea about uh, what I wanted to do, to do in terms of media or anything. Um, I described the site as an urban space in my presentation and already there I'm, I'm kind of saying that I'm considering different scales in London. And this is actually the most fundamental aspect of uh, what I have understood about my site. And so because of the lockdown, I have to approach the site as a reality that has changed because the site it exists both as um, a fiction in the project and as a reality of, of the site. So it requires different forms of measurement. But then because of the lockdown, the, both the site and the studio is out of reach and it was not possible to keep within the fold of what Unit 11 usually does in terms of instruments and, and methods. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's interesting in terms of how you adapt to a changing reality. Um, Jane, do you want to answer the question about your process? Yeah, sure. Um, so I also didn't go into the year with kind of a topic that I knew I wanted to explore. It kind of came about or because of my own background as an immigrant to the UK. Um, so the first term was also focused on research and um, basically after that we in Diploma 3 we tried to like find ways in which um, we can activate this research in different forums and uh, what I really liked about the unit uh, was that um, they really emphasized um, putting it in the real world and then trying to use that research in a way where you kind of understand what mechanisms and processes are available to you in order to um, activate it. Um, and for me, that was kind of like producing this handbook or producing videos where this information can be visualized. So, and I also took a trip to Calais um, at some point in the year to understand um, these spaces and the people there better. So yeah, so it was kind of a diverse approach can I add something? 
yeah. Sorry, yeah, I, I just wanted to add about uh, Diploma Unit 11 that I was in, because there's this kind of uh, mythology that everything is done by, by hand. Some even say that it's, it's uh, well made in a way that can't be uh, replicated in, in you know, digital environments. And in, this, uh, in these times, uh, we had to do everything digitally, or at least I had. Um, and so I don't like the idea of digital craft, but one thing that I learned in the unit is that um, to, to see a thing as being well made, you have to care as much for the things that are not seen as the things that are seen, if it makes any sense. Yeah, I think that that really does. And I, th I think that it's interesting to also think about the different media um, and tools that we use to communicate our ideas. And I think all of you kind of talked a little bit about how you did that both within the units framework, but also personally within your project. Um, I think just to pick up on something that Buster and Jane, both of you mentioned in very different ways, which was the idea of site. Um, I think every project and every unit kind of interprets site in their own way. And Buster, you said that the site was the driving kind of force behind the kind of creation of the project. Was, yeah. um, and, but Jane, you talked about uh, drawing on your personal experiences. And I think sometimes your personal experience can also be a different understanding of site or context. And I think each of your projects actually, like while they end up becoming projects that go beyond yourself, they probably started with something that you personally found um, uh, important or relevant and um, so I didn't know whether you could each talk about kind of how you read site into the project not just as the as a physical place where your project was situated but also um, as a, a kind of a, a bigger thing of, of the framing a kind of cultural context maybe of your project um, I don't know who if any anyone in particular wants to start with that one um. Maybe I can uh, correct myself or be, be more precise. Um, I said that site was the first thing, but actually it uh, can be described more as a, as a domain. And it's a domain of um, water, land, and property. And this is a domain that I explored already in fourth year. And I felt uh, there was still some, some bearing to it to investigate it more. The difference was that in this case, the domain became uh, in an urban context, so in, in London. And that is actually what made it a site in the end. So I definitely carried a personal interest going into the, into the term, um, but it was pretty clear to me what I wanted to look into. Hafiza, do you want to pick up on this idea of water and yeah, exactly. the yeah. domain as a site? <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of overlaps, I guess, in, in our projects, because I was also dealing with water and property and land. Um, and yeah, like the bigger, not my site is not just Brunei. I think I started the year because the brief was all about property. I was trying to think of ways of how property can be read differently. Um, and I looked at water settlements not as kind of an architectural or, or spatial way of settling, but like the cultural the culture of process of how, how it's ended up, how it has, how, how did we end up from water settlements to kind of the land urbanization that we have now. Um, and that was what I tried to kind of interrogate more in my, in my, in my written thesis, thesis, like um, how did this all come about? Why did people settle on water? Um, and I even went as back as far as kind of, um, uh, Garden of Eden and all, all these things and all these connotations of um, the first settlements and also how hunter gatherers looked at um, landscape and and the culture between um, uh, the ecological landscape and a place of belonging and that was what I how I sorry I tried to kind of bring that again at the end of my presentation which was my whole project was not about water settlements in general it's all it's about our um, mindset or how we view the ecological landscape as a place that um, that we um, belong to rather than belongs to us. So looking at kind of our environment differently was um, my bigger kind of um, aim of the project. So yeah, so, so it's not sight in kind of spatial way. 
is, but um, just psychologically as well, how we, how we view it. Um, I found it interesting. Yeah, I think that's interesting um, then to like to then look at Jane and Russell's where site is maybe um, also more problematic. Like in, in Jane's project, your site is something that, you know, people are excluded from or that are fleeing from. And in Russell's, yours is kind of trying to remove objects from a particular place because they're contested between maybe one, two or more places and rooting them more in a cultural context. So I don't know, um, Russell, do you want to talk first about your your conception of site and then we move to Jane? Um, so for me, the site, I guess, was the, the museum, more specifically the, the ethnographic museums, um, and really uh, removing conversations regarding decolonization and repatriation outside of that context or outside of that site, um, and really looking for a, the design of a, a kind of neutral space uh, tailor-made to each community that would be worked with um, to draw out whatever it is that they desired to be done with those artifacts. Um, and so it was very much critical of the idea of inviting source communities or diaspora into the museum context, which is very embedded um, with various um, kind of colonial ideals and ideas um, from the way in which it's it's structured and the types of expertise that are there to the way in which objects are curated. Um, and so, yeah, I guess in, in terms of site, it was really exploring the institution, both in its, you know, its physical architecture and then also in the kind of construction of its stakeholders um, and really wanting to remove, um, remove or kind of, yeah, remove that space. Uh, and find something that is uh, neutral and that is unthreatening and that is unlayered, um, if possible, uh, which I don't think is is possible, um, in those kind of preconceived ideas. Um, so, yeah, no specific site, um, but a desire for something new and or different. And Jane? Yeah, I think I also have, I mean, um, yeah, it's also similar to me to my project because physically there is no site. There's kind of a system of dispersed spaces and um, that are linked by the uh, identity of the migrants or migrant groups and spaces that the state is actively using against these people. But culturally and politically, I would say that um, it kind of is related to Brexit and this rhetoric of like anti-migrant sentiment that is part of British history from really long ago. And in the end, the, pro the site of my project kind of became spaces where we can actively participate in counteracting these hostile environment policies. So like throughout the year, I feel like site, the meaning of site kind of changed a lot for me um, from research into like actually designing something that could, um, yeah, that's part of my project. I guess it, it brings up really, I think a lot of your um, answers to this question brings up really interesting a question of audience, which I think we touched on a bit before um, when Russell was talking about institutions having a positive or negative reaction to his project. But I'm just curious as to like, how much do you think about who was the audience for this, for the project you were making throughout the year? And how much did that inform the way you constructed your presentation, um, but also the choice of media that you used? Um, and have you presented your project outside of the kind of academic setting to those audiences? So um, I don't know, maybe Jane, you want to start and we'll go backwards in order. <laughs> Yeah, um, I guess because Big Free really um, focused on how you can activate your research and um, projects in other contexts. So I was always kind of thinking about um, in what way or what method like uh, this project should be seen. And um, but on the other hand, it's also a lot to do with how media in the framework of like forensic architecture determines data, but we don't actually have data, and it's a way to kind of collect information and analyze them and to spatialize them that puts it together in three-dimensional space and with time and um, well videos is um, is a way for me to kind of like visualize um, these things when they usually have usually been reduced to like numbers and the statistics and it's a way to like kind of tell a story where you can follow through from like 
the starting point. And yeah, so I would say that's um, that's how I used the yeah, my project. Um, I guess Russell, do you want to go next and go backwards? Um, so uh, for me, um, uh, oh gosh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it crossed over kind of multiple forms of media. So the main thing was to kind of produce a, um, a short film that would kind of introduce uh, the idea of what the practice would be about, uh, what it would do, um, how it had been working with communities over the course of the year. Um, but also it was really important to me to be able to produce um, forms of documentation that was appropriate um, for each of the communities. Um, so in the case of the UK-based Maori community, it was about being able to create a matrix to understand who and who could not handle their artifacts, um, what kinds of protection, such as you know latex gloves or uh, cotton gloves, would they have to wear? What kind of apparatus would they use, um, which could be used by them to then pass on to other um, communities or other institutions? Um, in the case of the um, the Butu, a, a kind of fighting club from the Caribbean, it was about um, the stances that would be um, uh, that that would be done whilst holding the the Butu. And then in the case of the um, Ndemi, the, the mask from the Makonde people, um, it was about educating museums about three-year initiation cycles um, uh, and how to respect those cycles. So each of those different forms of documentation have their own kind of aesthetic, um, which obviously for the kind of the, the need for a kind of portfolio at the end of the year makes things quite difficult because there's nothing consistent in that each thing needs to be tailor-made in order to kind of communicate what it needs to communicate. So the film really was a way of um, making something coherent that really described the practice uh, and then the forms of documentation were the kind of more um, very kind of disparate separate um, documents uh, that needed to be made uh, to, to kind of communicate the the idea of what, what would come out of workshops with those communities. Um, yeah. Yeah, Pisa? You're on mute. Oh God, I always do this. Um, so you asked the question on audience. Um, so I guess um, my audience when I was doing the project was just to anyone who was open or curious about um, an alternative narrative of the typical kind of settling on land, but also um, uh, it was also kind of maybe to, to pay a bit of um, kind of it was a homage to people who were quite familiar with these water settlements or who came from them or who are quite familiar with them. So I'm sure lots of Southeast Asians are very familiar with water settlements. And I guess I wanted to um, interrogate the the water settlement in a way that hasn't been done before or kind of done it should be done more um in a different kind of um aspect to it so like in terms of property um but also um this was really intentional so my first term in my research i chose three uh case studies which were um not to me never talked about or even I didn't know much about it so I kind of put in effort to really find case studies um, that people didn't know of. even even my tutors didn't know uh, to uh, well they didn't know three of all my case studies um, and it was trying to um, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say but just um, yeah I wanted to do something that just wasn't talked enough in architecture school um, because yeah as a as an international student who's been in the uk for five five years um i feel like we are always repetitively shown the same examples or the same kind of topics so um yeah i, I did have an intention this year to be like okay i i want to do something um that we should talk about more um so um so that was my audience so in terms of like yeah hopefully people can see it and be like oh finally someone is talking about this um, it should have been talked about more. 
Um, and the second question was about media. Um, so I guess this essay writing count as media, but um, I also produced like a ma manual in the end because um, my proposal was a self-built um, settlement for the for the local residents. So the way the language I spoke was kind of in these um, like simple diagrams to show how the residents could use um, simple hand tools um, and the process of making their own houses or flotation modules um, and which was also part of my technical studies. Um, so that was kind of the language, like kind of simple, simple language um, that is um, accessible to everyone. And, um, and that, that kind of also ties into like the bigger um, question that we were um, thinking about in our unit, which was what was the role of the architect nowadays, which I know we talk about so much, but um, you know, it's still constantly evolving. Um, and for us as a unit, it was always that architects aren't the people who design specific, like the doorknobs or whatever. It's about um, thinking about how we can um, question problems and um, become a kind of mediator between lots of different stakeholders and um, design a framework um, of how um, to, yeah, something to do with the, the built environment and stuff. So. Um, yeah, also, sorry, media, uh, I tried to, because I was talking about like water settlements and this idea of property being fluid and not static. So I tried to make my images kind of animated with like the waters moving um, in my presentation. Um, and um, just, um, I, you know, I tried to make, oh no, never mind, I'll stop. Um, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Buster, do you want to talk about audience and the role of media in kind of reaching out to that audience? Yeah, I, I would uh, add to uh, Hafiz's um, uh, answer to um, who she addresses as an audience. And I would agree that um, I'm addressing anyone. And I would even go as far as to say I address no one in particular. And it means that if anyone has a sustained interest in what I'm doing, it means that we are in the same world in my mind. So my site is the Victoria Embankment on the Thames. It's an artificial uh, land and it's overlooking the river and we're at a safe distance from it, which is very much like during the lockdown. So there is a kind of custom developing where I relate to the project on the same basis as you are, as an audience. So I am as much as an audience as, as you are. And that's, I think it's, it's almost uh, necessary in my case to communicate the project. Great. I but mean, we, I agree, we agree, we agree on some, let's, we have to agree on some basic, some fundamental issues, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what's so interesting about all your answers as well, there are some overlaps, they're all quite different. And I don't think that's necessarily just because they were produced in different units. I think it's really about attitudes and approaches to, to, the, to the project. And I think every student comes up with their own approach as they work on it. Um, I would like to open this up to questions. because I'm sure all of you have questions for um, the four of them. Um, but maybe while you're thinking of your questions, um, I can ask them one more, which is really just to ask like what receiving diploma with honors means to each of you. Um, to ask a question, you can either like use the raise hand tool on Zoom, which is I think under participants, um, or you just type it in the chat and I can read it out if you don't want to ask it, um, but um, it's bubbly. But um, in the meantime, maybe, um, I don't know, whoever wants to start, do you want to talk about what getting honors meant or if it meant anything at all? <laughs> I'd like to think it means as much uh, objectively as it does personally. And in the end, it's, it's a matter of uh, standards. I don't know the exact phrasing, but it says that uh, the AA honors is awarded for exceptionally high standard during the academic year. And so I, I see myself or my project situated within that same 
standard. And in any case, it's, it's beyond my own judgment. So what it means is I don't have to convince myself that I'm, I did my best because I trust the AA. I trust that the AA is fair. Yeah. Good answer. Jane, do you want to add to that? Uh, I think it means that I've had a really good support system throughout the year. <laughs> you helped me through everything. I'm not sure if it means that my project is of a certain standard, but I do think that, you know, I did try quite hard. So, yeah, so I want to thank everyone who was, uh, you know, kind of, you know, working with me, talking to, to me, etc., and helping me with this. Uh, Fisa? Uh, yeah, I definitely agree with Jane. Um, uh, it's more, well, I personally, I think it's just reflective of um, my tutors or my colleagues and, and everything and how they've supported me because, yeah, obviously wouldn't have got here without them. And, but yeah, no, it definitely means a lot to me because um, especially this year, this crazy year that we've been through and also, um, yeah, I, li I really remember exactly distinctively how I felt two years ago when I was a new student, uh, which probably most of you are. Um, coming in fourth year and then seeing the four uh, projects presented. And I remember like what Manishi said earlier, being super, super intimidated um, and super just kind of worried um, to not fail basically, because I just, I was just quite scared. But I guess the moral of the story is, is just, just do your best and just um, maximize all your time with your tutors and friends and colleagues and just try to make a, project that you're really happy with um, is my main takeaway and not think about trying to get honors or, or things like that. It's, it's a bit silly, but yeah. And Russell? Um, yeah, uh, it was amazing. I, I didn't uh, expect it. Um, I, I think my, my intention coming towards the end of the year was to, to try and push this kind of beyond um, you know, beyond that, the, the confines of, of the school year. And it's really helped me to do that. It's been that kind of, um, the, the kind of push and the pat on the back, because now not only have I made that commitment to myself, but other people have believed in it enough that actually I have to kind of, I have to follow through with, with those, um, with all of those things. So, yeah, that's that's what it means. Extra pressure <laughs> for uh, yeah for the for the foreseeable future. Yeah, there's some really lovely answers. I mean, I think so much of it. I mean, it is amazing to receive honors and very well deserved. I think each of these projects are so terrific, as well as the others that couldn't be here today. I think you should definitely, if you haven't already, watch them all online. But it is also a product of like all the different kind of input and references and things that you're exposed to over the year and the people that, that kind of support you and make it happen. And um, it's definitely not down to any one thing. And then I think the way that we determine who gets honors is really just each tutor has their own criteria in their head about what they think is relevant and important. And it's the projects that resonate and stay with you that, that you then end up voting on. Um, there's a question from the audience um, about uh, asking how the, like they believe that the units promote a multidisciplinary approach towards research um, for each project. But they were wondering whether the breadth of research at times can hinder you getting to the crux of what your project is about. And I don't know if any of you want to talk about that, like whether, you know, how do you, how do you move from research into design or can you continue because at times I think there's a way you can continue researching forever and spreading yourself thin and so how do you start to focus in and start designing your project uh, shall I, shall yeah, I go? Go for it. Um, I think that you could if you wanted to you could research forever um, and you will always find that there's something more to know and there's something that you've missed out and all of these other things. Um, and really it's about um, self-discipline. It's also about learning where to get your sources and your information from. Um, I think it's a lot about reaching out to people who are experts in those fields um, rather than 
starting from the beginning and trying to make yourself an expert in that field um, and understanding that it's a collaborative process from the very beginning. Um, and I think that that really helps to know that from the beginning um, and to not let your, maybe maybe it's not an ego thing, but but being willing to be wrong and to make mistakes because the quicker you make them, the, the kind of quicker you're gonna learn. You don't wanna make them, you know, at the end of the year. Um, and um, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, you can get mired in the research, but at some point your truth is gonna say you need to design something and you're, you're gonna need to design it. So yeah, uh, tightening up your methodology, your research methodology um, as soon as possible um, is really important. It's something you can take with you each year. I want to react to the word multidisciplinary. Um, even, even if it's promoted, you don't have to be multidisciplinary. And you can, you can choose one or two disciplines. That's fine. Because in the end, okay, I might sound conservative, but it's a school of architecture. And you can incorporate one aspect of geology, as I do in my project, and one aspect of law. And the my role becomes to compile a material in the end. And that's it. That might sound simple, but that's, that's how I see it. No, I, think, I think it's a really good point because um, I think as architects, we love to borrow tools and techniques from other disciplines, but we always have to think like, why are they different? Because they're done by an architect. Like what about them as spatial or urban or, you know, how do you translate the tool from one discipline into architecture? So yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, do you, I guess Jane and Hafiza, do you want to add anything to that, that question on research versus design? Maybe I'll just add that. I think one of the biggest, um, well, I think time is one of the most important facts that into the, when you're determining when you have to stop your research, eventually at some point in the year, you're going to get to a point where you know, you have to stop and you kind of have to like pick and choose what you want to go into. Um, so yeah, you'll, you'll find out when you get there, I guess. Uh, so for my unit, it was quite like, uh, how do I say it? It's just very, it, it's organized in a way where there's like output kind of, uh, benchmark. So like I said earlier, like first term, you would have this essay and I think that's why, um, we dedicate completely first term in just, uh, reading and, and writing. Um, so that's really good at like trying to um, accumulate all the information and also kind of frame your argument succinctly uh, when you're writing it. So I think for me, it was easier because I knew I had to, to come to a conclusion um, at the end of first term. Um, and um, yeah, and then, yeah, and then, yeah, they'll, your tutors will help you on, on how to um, made that transition from research to to design, um, but yeah, made less less interesting. But like, the the essay was a good deadline basically to 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 stop research. Um, I guess the there's we're running out of time, so we probably only have time for a few more questions. But um, so maybe like just the first person who wants to answer each of these, I'll just read them out quickly. So. Um, one question is, um, I think Buster stated a site is both a form of fiction and a projected reality. How does the inhabitant psychology and emotions related to the occupation of spaces influence like the way you research, plan and execute a design? So like, how much do you think about like, I guess, who it's for? Um, Buster, you're on mute. It goes into what I said about an audience. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't address anyone in particular. It does uh, accommodate different users. So we have the geologists, the archeologists, uh, the mud larkers coming into the proposal, let's say at different stages of its existence. And of course I have to, um, I, I have to base the proposal on uh, a kind of use and a kind of community that I've seen and that I've and that I've studied, but I'm not I'm not uh, projecting any program or or anything in the for this project in in particular. 
It's yeah. it's more a form of accommodation, I would say. And then um, another question said that during the creation of your project, how much consideration went into the investigation of the biotic, abiotic and human environment surrounding your project? So I guess, you know, as architects, we often just design for humans, but what uh, what considerations were there for like the wider non-human world around it? Um, I would say that uh, they came as far as being considerations. I didn't do any deep study into this uh, abiotic environments, but there was definitely at, in the back of my head that um, by not imposing a program, I'm also keeping it open for uh, different forms of existence in the future. And so my the, the span of my project is from back eight centuries and forwards eight centuries, let's say. Jane, any non-human considerations in the body politic? Yeah, I mean, definitely. The concept of body politic itself is um, much more abstract, I guess. Um, and um, I think that because uh, the brief and the framework that I was within encouraged really a lot of um, like consideration of environments and totality of like spaces as architecture that really it went beyond just what we consider kind of like physical but it also became the weather or like specific um, enclosed environments or you know going back to basics like housing or asylum housing in particular um, so yeah it was really a range of different spaces that you could explore when it comes to your projects um, Afisa? Um, uh, let's see. Um, I'm not really sure how to answer that question. Um, maybe something that was kind of a bit wider, kind of a wider breadth was about like looking at how we treat uh, our ecology, so like rivers and stuff. So in, in my project, I tried to look at how can the settlement also clean the river in, in itself. Um, so kind of employing these different technologies um, and and also technically like that's why I propose it to be floating anyways because I didn't want um, anything to kind of embed itself permanently on the environment um, so we're kind of always um, just kind of touching the the earth quite lightly um, yeah I think that's, that's all. good answer. Um, and Russell, I guess you talked about these different, like the different artifacts and like the cultures around that. So maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, I just had to Google abiotic, um, by the way, just so you know. Um, so um, for for my project, I guess I didn't really, t I didn't really touch on these ideas myself. Um, at the same time, in working with these artifacts. Um, a lot of the communities, actually, maybe it's easier to explain where I started. At the, at the very beginning of the project, when I looked at each of the artifacts, um, I started to draw, draw things uh, very similarly to, to Neufert, um, but trying to adapt Neufert for these artifacts. Uh, and many of the artifacts had these additional elements that were kind of non-human, if you like. So the mask uh, was inhabited by a spirit. So how do we then kind of measure or scale that spirit in relation to the mask, in relation to the person? And it ended up kind of being these strange diagrams where the human was kind of set out with, um, with heights and sizes. And then there was a kind of NA for this um, invisible unseen spiritual element. And I feel like to some degree that exists in all of those artifacts because all of them were imbued um, to some degree with ancestral spirit or with a god-like spirit um, and with each of the communities that they came from there was very much a, a, a strong relationship with the land um, from which these artifacts came and the uh, materials from which they were made um, and I guess I, don't, I can't remember what the question is um, but part yeah I guess to some degree part of that consideration comes into how they're handled um, and how the community wishes for them to be used. I guess that's still human to some degree. I don't know. I have to think about that one. 
So I guess, I mean, no, everyone, um, especially you guys have to go soon to go back to work. But um, the, as a final question, I think um, Emma has posted one in the chat, which is great, which was, she was wondering if you found uh, some specific elements in your projects that you're still hungry to research and develop or design further. And that was going to be my last question, actually, which is to find out what you guys are all doing now, having graduated. And um, what are the afterlives of these amazing projects? Like, how do they continue in the world outside the AA? So, um, yeah, maybe Hafiza, do you want to go first? Uh, okay, sure. <laughs> um, uh, so I think I'm going to go back to Brunei and start working there because, yeah, I'm, I have a, uh, my work in the public uh, architects in the government, basically. Um, and I think what this year has taught me um or that i take away from it is that yeah like i i definitely want to do something about home and and um change or um change the narrative of how we see architecture in brunei because it's still kind of um uh it's still kind of uh it's just not there yet i don't know how, how to say that eloquently um so um gosh i forgot what the question is now what am i going to do um and yeah, I, I think it, 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 it's fired up in me like this passion to to actually um, have an effect on on in Brunei. And I plan to kind of present my project, this fifth year project, to the the architects in the uh, in the public service. I'm not sure if it will go down well, but I think it's just kind of interesting to to see how how we can look at Kampong Ayer, the the water settlement, because it is such an overdone project, and they're always trying to question like how can we make this this better. So I think that's a really interesting um, thing I want to continue. Um, also, um, no, I'll, I'll stop there. I won't, I won't mention anything else. Okay, next person. <laughs> <laughs> um, Buster, do you want to talk about what you're going to do next and how you take these ideas forward? Yeah, I, I will be teaching in a course in CMS this year called Shapes of Fiction. Um, by coincidence, we'll be discussing a lot about tides, fictional tides in this case, but I'm quite happy because um, I think that tides and tidal ranges are uh, kind of unexplored uh, aspects of city cities, which um, might become very important in the future. They're already important. Just uh, the case of the foreshore of of the Thames, you have public spaces that are submerged and they appear and they become accessible. And that's a very interesting field of, of uh, research, how that works. Russell? Um, so yeah, I'm trying to continue the project as much as possible, um, sending it anywhere and everywhere. Um, so it will be included next year in um, a publication for the UK and Republic of Ireland um, called Museums of the Future, um, which is going to be sent to different museums of, of potentially ways for them to kind of reform the way that they're structured or ways of uh, working with communities. Um, and then at the moment, I'm working with some artifacts from Grenada, uh, where my grandfather's from, I was hoping to visit this October, I don't know whether it's going to happen. Um, but looking at ways of kind of adaptively uh, reusing those artifacts uh, for carnival, um, both uh, here in the UK um, as well as in Grenada. So potentially working with some costume designers here um, on uh, kind of yeah, referencing those artifacts for that. Um, and then just constantly talking to different museums and just trying to keep conversations going. Yeah. And Jane? Well, okay. Well, I'm actually working in architecture right now, so the departure slightly from um, what I was working on for my project. But I think, um, like, having spent a whole year on it, I feel like really you can't ever actually, you know, leave your project in a way because you've already been thinking about it for a year or maybe more in some cases. And maybe the things I took away the most is kind of like a way of thinking about the things around us or the spaces in the architecture but also you know skills um to kind of see if you can see if i can participate in organizing 
um, locally around me in the, you know, movements or politics that are happening and what I can do, you know, to um, kind of like participate in these things and encourage them to continue. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I don't think we realize the impact our diploma projects have on our long term careers at the time, but um, I definitely think about mine most days. It's probably informed every brief I've ever written or project I've done, um, sometimes without me realizing it. So I think the same will be true, not just for the four of you, but for everybody probably on this call. So um, I just wanted to thank the four of you for coming and, and, and speaking about the kind of behind the scenes process of how you worked on your projects. Um, four really incredible projects uh, as a collection um, and uh, in addition to like the other, th the three that can come here today, um, I really can only encourage the rest of you to, to watch the presentations, look at their detailed explanations on projects review, experience the AR amazing experience that Jane put together of the different images and, and models. And um, yeah, I just, I, I'm excited to see how much you guys are already doing in the few months since you graduated and I can't wait to follow your careers and see what you do next. So a big thank you to all of you. Um, I might try and do a mass unmute so everyone can clap. Um, so thank you.